Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, dear Mr. Zamoyski. It is my great pleasure to host you all in our new multimedia room uh, of the Jagiellonian University, located here in the Polish Social and Cultural Association. This is already the eighth uh, in the series of the Jagiellonian lectures. We already had lectures by Sir Leszek Borysiewicz from Cambridge University, also by His Excellency Ambassador of the Republic of Poland, Mr. Witold uh, Sopkow. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Adam Zamoyski, a famous British historian of Polish descent, who has been kind and agreed to share with us his knowledge and opinions concerning facts, fiction, and imagination in writing of Polish history. To quote Napoleon, uh, history is the version of past events that people have uh, agreed upon. So it's a certain convention. That is why I'm convinced that this lecture will inspire us to look at Polish history uh, from slightly different angle uh, and maybe look into the future with more positive optics perspectives. I'm very glad we can host this lecture here at POSC. Uh, Jagiellonian University is present here already for, for two months, providing uh, education opportunities for Poles living in the UK. And this is a special place because um, a particular institution where uh, the past meets with the present and possibly with the future. Once again, Mr. Zamoyski, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation to give a lecture in the Jagiellonian lecture series. Uh, I wish you a pleasant evening and fruitful discussion afterwards because uh, Mr. Zamoyski kindly agreed to open the floor for a few questions for discussion after, after his lecture. Uh, also, his uh, books can be purchased, and he kindly agreed to sign them after after the lecture. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to an honorary guest, Mr. Adam Zamoyski. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm only holding this for recording purposes. I hope you can all hear me without it anyway. Um, there can hardly be a town or even a village in Poland which doesn't have a street named after Tadeusz Kościuszko. Every major town has a monument to him. I dare say you'd find great trouble in finding a street anywhere in Poland named after King Stanisław August Poniatowski and there's certainly no monument to him. There is hardly a village or a town in Poland that doesn't have something named after Napoleon. And there's a square in Poland, in Warsaw, named after him, with a monument on it to him. You'd be hard put to it to find any mention of the penultimate king of Poland, Tsar Alexander I, King Alexander II of Poland, anywhere, and certainly no monument. In Warsaw, there's a circus named after General de Gaulle, and there's a great statue of him there. I have not yet come across a street or even an alleyway, let alone a monument, dedicated to the memory of Winston Churchill. Tadeusz Kościuszko was a competent general, no doubt a great patriot, who led an ill-fated, ill-advised, and fatal uprising which divided Polish society and brought about the end of the final um, erasure of the Polish state from the map of Europe. 
King Stanisław August fought long and hard to maintain Polish independence at any price. No other monarch put so much into the development of the nation, into nation building, into building up the Polish state, into building up edu the educational system, and indeed educating people like Tadeusz Kościuszko, who would never ever have had an education had it need not been for the initiatives of King Stanislaw August. Napoleon Bonaparte is responsible for the death of at least 100,000 Polish soldiers um, who died completely in vain, not in the Polish cause. Tsar Alexander fought long and hard at the Congress of Vienna and guaranteed the creation of a kingdom of Poland, albeit a small one, albeit in personal union with Russia. Nevertheless, a kingdom with the most liberal constitution in Europe, with an educational system that allowed people like, like um, Chopin, Mickiewicz, and Witwicki, and all those uh, poets to flourish uh, and to have their works printed in Polish. General de Gaulle had no association with Poland except for the fact that in 1920, he was part of the French military mission to Poland, which gave him the opportunity to write an article um, in which he expressed extremely condescending views about the Poles. His only other connection was that in 1944, he was the first of the Allied governments to re recognize the Lublin Committee. Winston Churchill, on the other hand, uh, was a friend, genuine friend of Poland and did all he could, which wasn't very much, by the time he'd been outmaneuvered by Roosevelt um, to ensure uh, some, uh, some measure of uh, independence for Poland after the war. This is all the result of bad history and false perceptions. Generations of Poles have been brought up with certain ideas on certain people and certain events which have absolutely nothing to do with the facts. Now, all his history is fundamentally mythology, beginning with um, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, the Romans with Romulus and Remus, um, every uh, European nation has its myths, its uh, um, King Arthur and the Round Table. Um, we have them in Poland. We've got uh, Lech, Czech and Rus and King Popiel and Przemysław. Um, all these myths are fair enough. Uh, and people lived with them for many centuries and it didn't really matter. Modern historiography only really got going in the 18th century when people began to write what was supposed to be scientific histories based on fact and documents, on proven evidence. In Poland, the first one to do so was Bishop Adam Naruszewicz, commissioned to do it by King Stanisław August Poniatowski. He was followed at the beginning of the 19th century by Joachim Lelevel, supposedly even more scientific in his approach. The only problem is that all these histories, wherever they were written, whether they were written in England, in France, in Germany, were all written with fundamentally at the back the aim and the program of nation building and state building. Therefore the evidence and the facts were interpreted, first of all they were chosen selectively and they were interpreted in various ways. Also because it was the 19th century and because the state was seen, there was a an element of Darwinian competition amongst states, and the states were seeing 
as being viable only if it could show its power, wealth, and it could only show the power and the wealth either on the battlefield or by uh, tremendous economic uh, preponderance. As a result, certain views and certain parameters uh, were considered to be, as it were, good things, um, which every nation should be proud of, and other things were seen as bad things, which only recidivist and not very competent nations um, got up to. Battles were absolutely essential to this thing. There was a kind of Olympics of how many battles you won. And of course, because every nation, these, these histories that were being written in the 19th century were being written for home consumption in order to create a docile society which was faithful to the idea of the nation and the state and would therefore make good soldiers, good functionaries, good um, subjects of the new um, political edifice. Um, it wasn't really important what the other people on the other side of the frontier thought about it. So in writing um, these histories, historians could allow themselves a certain leeway. They weren't actually going to be a German historian, wasn't going to be criticized by a French historian because the French historians were too busy creating their own um, idea of French history. And for instance, uh, new myths arose. The French, if you read French histories, um, certainly anything up till about 50 years ago, you get the distinct impression that something called France existed for at least a thousand years. The idea that actually something called the Kingdom of France, which owned, which possessed, and which contained anything like what is, we see as present-day France, is completely dismissed. Uh, the fact that half of France belonged to the British crown, to the English crown, for centuries is not is presented as a temporary invasion occupation. Um, every nation went in for this kind of very subtle um, distortion. And of course they only mentioned those things that were important to them. When I was about 10 years old, I used to spend all my summers in France. Um, staying with some cousins. And I rather fancied myself as a historian, and I thought I knew everything. And I remember once we were having a, a, um, a discussion about battles and victories, and I said, well, we we're talking about English victories and French victories. And I said, well, and what about Poitiers? And they stared at me blankly and said, well, what about Poitiers? We won that. And I said, no, you jolly well didn't. And we had a fantastic row which ended in fisticuffs. And it was only later that both of us realized that there were two battles of Poitiers. And of course, the French were only taught about the really important one in 732 when Charles Martel beat back um, the Muslims. And actually, it really was an important one for, for European history. And the English were only taught about um, the one in 1350 something um, during the Hundred Years' War a minor battle of no importance where the English beat the French. Uh, I was always fascinated, because I used to live in, in, in St. John's Wood at one stage, um, by the name Maid of Vale, which some of you may know. Um, it's a rather Maid of Vale. It sounds odd. I sort of wondered whether it came from maidens or something. Uh, it was only years, years later that I discovered that it was named, and there's a Maida Vale and a Maida Hill, and um, it was named after the Battle of Maida in Calabria in 1806, I think, when a, a British force from Sicily, where it was guarding the poor old Bourbons who had been thrown out of Naples by Napoleon, um, crossed over and landed in the boot of Italy and defeated 
a French brigade. There was about 5,000 people on each side. And it was a completely ineffectual, completely pointless, and a total sideshow of no importance to anybody at all involving very few people. However, it was the first time the Brits had actually won anything on the European mainland since Blenheim for 100 years. They had been consistently be beaten whenever they got over. So it was turned into this great thing. We in Poland make a big thing out of Somosiera, which is you know, just a, a minor sideshow. Uh, similarly, certain heroic things were used to cover up disasters. An absolute classic example in, um, in, in British historiography is the way that the Battle of Rourke's Drift, um, which was a heroic but nevertheless completely meaningless skirmish, uh, was used to cover up, and, and lots of George Cro um, Victoria Crosses were given there, in order to cover up the absolutely disastrous defeat two days before at Isandlwana, where the entire British force was wiped out by the Zulus. Um, this is how historians wrote history, because battles were important. The other thing was stealing battles. Very, very important. So the British, very cleverly and, and, and um, very good thing for, for Europe and for France, um, completely took over the um, victory of Waterloo, which was largely won by um, the intervention of the Prussians. Uh, but they managed to label it immediately as a British victory. And since nobody liked the Prussians, everybody at the time accepted it as a British victory, and everybody was happy with that. Um, uh, I, small footnote, at the weekend I was staying in France, and in the same house party there was a, a, a gentleman by the sonorous name of Le Prince Dessling, who was called his family name was Massena. He was descended from the Napoleonic Marshal. And he was much distressed by the fact that while the British, Belgian, and German governments were all preparing for a great commemoration in 1815 of the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the French government of Monsieur Hollande was not interested. And he thought this was an ex it would have been an excellent occasion for the French and the Germans to gang up and actually prove that the British hadn't won it. It would have been a minor, minor revenge for France to have done this. So the, the battle is very important. Um, the Battle of Grunwald was, in the 19th century, uh, written up by, in Russian histori historiography, as being fundamentally a Russian victory with Lithuanian, Tatar, and Polish input. Um, let us not forget also that we, or Poland, claims the great victory at Vienna in 1683, although the Poles made up barely one-third of the army. Um, this kind of um, his political historiography created a number of its own myths. In... Um, in Polish historiography, it, in the first place, because it was being written not from some historical academy like the German or the French historians or the British were sitting in their universities well-funded and they could afford to write their five-volume or ten-volume or twenty-volume histories of France, England, um, Germany. The Poles couldn't. They were all sitting around in exile in Paris. Um, or elsewhere, and um, didn't know whether they were going to be able to publish in many cases. So the first thing they, they had to do was to sort of say, what was the point of Poland? I mean, was there a reason for Poland to exist? Hence the, the, the propagation of the, of, of the idea that Poland had been the bulwark of Christendom, the ante morale Christianitatis, that Poland had had a function. Okay, the Italians had produced art, uh, the French had produced all sorts of things, the Germans, the British had created an empire and uh, parliamentary democracy and so on. But the Poles had had a function. We'd kept, we'd kept the Turks at bay, we had kept the infidels, we'd kept the eastern hordes out. 
which was, of course, a terrible myth, because as we can see, we failed to keep them out because we let Russia right into Europe, and that's why we had lost our own country. But never mind. The idea was that, that there had been this great military effort throughout the centuries, um, and as, as I pointed out in one of my books, I, I think that um, I calculated, I actually worked this out, that um, in the 17th century, Polish poets contributed more lines of verse to, to the idea of the defense against, to the, to the wars in the East than they did soldiers to, to the actual fighting. Um, the other thing was that we had kept the German Drachenachosten out, and we had created a center of Christian sort of humanism and of culture, uh, sort of non-Germanic um, culture in that part of the world. But also it depended slightly on your political program, because Le Level, who didn't like the, um, so to speak, right-wing view of history, which was being propounded by some historians of the Sarmatian view of Polish history, uh, invented a so-called scientific idea that the Poles had originally constituted a wonderful society in which everybody had been equal and they had all lived in marvelous little communes and they'd never needed kings or noblemen or anybody like that. And his idea was that if we were all to return to this, uh, the world would be a better place. And so he was kind of suggesting that the Poles had originally um, created a sort of inspiring model, which was, of course, complete fiction. Um, then, as the century progressed, uh, and ca the captivity, the length of captivity became more difficult to bear, uh, various other currents emerged to interpret Polish history. One was denial. Okay, we can't compete with the Germans, the French, the English, the Russians. But we've got something that they didn't have. We, we triumphed on the moral plane. And we are, in fact through various messianic ideas, we are in fact doing something rather grander and better. Um, this, this, this is a, a, an age-old thing of, of um, how, to, how to deal with failure, is turn it into moral victory. Most famously, the Russians in 1812 at Borodino, um, Kutuzov uh, said, yes, but Borodino was a moral victory for Russia. Um, they, the whole army was completely shattered. They had to retreat and give up Moscow. But never mind, it was a moral victory. Um, and a whole strain of Polish historiography suggested, they didn't write it as such, but suggested that actually you know, there, there were more important things than just winning battles and having frontiers and a state. And then people also began to... as it were, examine the Polish conscience. They began to think, well, actually, we did fail. We were wiped off the map. It was our fault, mea culpa. We all ought to um, think again about who we are, how we are, what we did. And hence, the Krakow School, the Steinchik School, began this self-flagellation um, to, as it were, to sort of, you know, say we got it all wrong, um, everything we did uh, was bad. We must start again. We must be more like um, like the English or the French or the Germans and be more realistic and stop all this um, sort of Polish fantasia nonsense. Um, but also, other currents emerged, and it depended how you saw the future, because everybody in Poland hoped to recover statehood. But what kind of a state was it going to be? Was it going to be some people hoped that we would recreate the old Rzeczpospolita of many nations with its multicultural and multinational content? In which case, you had to write history to present history as 
Wasn't it marvellous, the old Rzeczpospolita, with all its imperfections, it was nevertheless a very congenial place in which Tatars, Poles, Lithuanians, Jews, Ruthenes could all live happily together. Or, if you were taking a modern view, that Poland should become a nation-state like the Germans or the French, um, you took the view that actually the union of Lublin had been a mistake. We should never have had anything to do with Lithuania. What we should be doing is concentrating on recapturing Pomerania, Silesia, and um, pointing to that. So all sorts of completely conflicting um, things came out of this. Um, one thing was common to all those histories was that certain things were deemed bad. And for instance, um, the whole culture of Sarmatism and the Liberum Veta were simply considered as some kind of a disease and uh, an, an absolutely inadmissible and mad, um, perverse aberration to be condemned and so on. The other thing was that, for instance, Stanislav August was completely labelled as a, an, the worst king in Polish history, virtually, as decadent, um, useless, who spent money on building palaces on the arts, when it should have all been spent on building the upper big army and so on. Um, and the other thing that came in as well in the 19th century was the concept of the traitor. You know, those, some people were good because they had stood by Poland as the 19th century historians imagined it had been at the time, and some were bad. And here, for instance, Sienkiewicz, you know, the, the, the poor old Radziwiłls are you know, simply dismissed as traitors. Um, then later, the, the, the wretched um, signatories of, of Targowica are all dismissed as traitors, pure and simple, and so on. In the 20th century, as we moved into the 20th century and in the Second Republic, the same um, things applied, that we were building a new modern Polish nation, therefore the multicultural Sarmatian um, culture was bad. Um, the fact that all the soldiers that Stanislav August could have raised with the money he spent on palaces and art and, 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 and schools um, would have um, succumbed to the Russians anyway was ignored. Um, and and a, a very positive kind of history was written up. After 1945, a great deal changed. Interestingly enough, the communists kept a lot of uh, the pre-war stuff, particularly the very nationalist stuff, because it was actually very convenient that an awful lot of aristos had been labelled as traitors, so they could carry on being labelled as traitors. Um, so that was useful. Uh, but certain things changed. Russia became good, Germany became very bad. So there was a whole lot of work done, some of it very good, on the western Zyskane, the recovered lands that had been German, and endless books on the early Piasts, which didn't actually make too much of the fact that every single Piast prince from the first <coughs> for the first 500 years, married a German princess. In fact, the Piasts were thoroughly Germanic in, in, in by blood uh, by about the 11th century. Um, but there was a great thing about this great Slav wall on the east and much less about the Antemurale and the eastern wall. Um, and, the, and the Russians, obviously, I mean, the, the uh, post-war... Um, historiography uh, was much more generous to, for instance, Stanislav August because they well, first of all, he had had the, his vision had been that one can't do anything without Russia and therefore this 
fitted very nicely with what was going on after 1945, uh, but also his um, educational and cultural input was valued, and people suddenly realized that actually if it hadn't if he'd wasted all that money on some tin pot army which would have been defeated anyway by the Russians and the Prussians, um, we wouldn't have the Royal Castle in Warsaw, Wazhenki, we wouldn't have had the uh, Shkola Ritserska, we wouldn't have had a whole lot of literature, um, and very possibly um, Poland wouldn't have uh, survived culturally through the long period of occupation. Since 1989, of course, things have changed again. And it's time for revisionism. And above all, for looking at the period that was out of bounds during the communist years. So the Second Republic could be reevaluated. One could write about 1920. The Second World War could be written about in a different way. Katyn could be written about. The Warsaw Uprising could be reevaluated in a more um, serious way. The whole issue of the Jews and Polish anti-Semitism could be gone over. And of course, as things ha- these things work, there's always a lot of bending over backwards one way or another. And with, as with all res- revisionism, uh, there is exaggeration on both sides. Um, and because it is recent history, there's a lot of emotion involved. Because nations are constructs of human beings, and they therefore behave like human beings. And nations are liable to the same anxieties, emotions, um, the same uh, wisdom and silliness as human beings. Nations need their comfort zones, hence their myths. Nations go into denial about certain things, just as human beings do. They deceive themselves, as we all do. Um, They try and justify themselves in bizarre ways, as we all do. And the the situation where Poland is at the moment and where Polish historiography is at the moment is very much... um, is, is, is governed by emotions and as a result also by the, I wouldn't even say the political view of sec- sections of the population and of certain historians, but the, the outlook, which is obviously connected with a political point of view. And the point about nations like people is that they should grow up and if you look at British historiography over the last 50 years or so you can see there has been a lot of extremely intelligent revisionism it has been a process of growing up a process of acknowledging yes we didn't win the war alone it was actually the Americans and the Russians that did most of it yes the British Empire wasn't ideal. We did go around killing a lot of people. Yes, we didn't actually, weren't entirely, we didn't do Enigma entirely on our own. Yes, there were some Poles. They don't give quite enough, but there were some Poles. Ditto the Battle of Britain, and so on and so on. It's called growing up. It's called facing up to reality and accepting um, certain things. Um, (coughs) Poland, I think, is also trying to grow up and uh, being quite brave about confronting some quite painful realities and some unexpected ones, um, particularly to do with, with um, painful issues such as the, the, the whole question of the Jews and, and Pol- Polish um, relations with them. Um, 
one of the most... But the point is that it is essential to grow up because it's only by growing up and putting things where they should be, i.e. consigning them to history rather than to an emotional or political agenda, that one can see straight. Um, And a very good example of, of a problem here is the whole cutting business, which has been subsumed into into almost a political debate about the soul of Poland and who everybody is in Poland and how they should look at the world. Um, What's more, it has bred an absurdity called cutting too, which I don't want to go into. Um, And the point is that if you have open bits of history, which are like running sores, it actually has a very bad, not only does it lead to bad history and bad myths, but it also prevents people from actually getting on with their lives. It, doesn't, it arrests the well-being of nations. The, it also uh, induces um, a sense of victimhood, a sense of paranoia, and people enjoy. The trouble is that people enjoy um, paranoia and victimhood just as much as they enjoy triumphalism. Indeed, I think one of the uh, most astonishing things about the Polish character is that it combines an inferiority complex with a superiority complex in a way that no other nation manages. Um, Why does this matter? Just, I feel that history matters because we should all know the past for obvious reasons. But why does it matter about these perceptions, these sort of comfort zones that we retreat back into? Um, Put it this way. In 1989, Poland recovers its independence. And what choice does Poland make, Polish society and government? Almost, well, almost unanimously, it opts to join the European Union and NATO. It's what the Americans call a no-brainer. You know, we've had the experience of our eastern neighbor. The obvious thing is join these clubs uh, for security. Well, two decades on, the world has changed. There's no Cold War. Russia's in a different place. China has become a dominant. America is, to a large extent, losing interest in Europe, and the European Union is in crisis, to put it mildly. Now, just as a sort of joke, just as an idea, because history suddenly changes, suddenly things begin to drift in different directions that nobody expected. Just suppose... I'm not saying this is going to happen or it's it's even likely, but just suppose, just suppose the Germans suddenly decide that they've had enough breast-beating about the Second World War, that they're fed up with Latin Europe taking their money, and that they would actually like to try their own destiny as a dominant. And next door, on their eastern border, there is Poland, which they've, over the last two decades, grown to appreciate as a very good workforce, people you can do business with, sensible people. And beyond Poland is Russia, a complete basket case with the greatest store of natural resources on Earth. And just... Imagine that Germany decides we can create our own little, or not so little, um, economico-political entente union, call it what you will, based on Germany in the cockpit, Poland as its the executive arm, and Russia as its um, pool of raw materials. Were such an incredible scenario to arise, Poland 
would, if it had any brains at all, join in and enthusiastically, hoping thereby to regain its influence and even um, extend its influence to the East. But what happens if we are still sitting there, if every Pole is sitting there going on about Second World War and Katyn and Targovica and Grunwald and the Teutonic Knights and says, no, we're going to stick with Paris and Rome because we are, as we liked to imagine ourselves, more civilized and cultivated than these other people. What would happen then? Ladies and gentlemen, history is like, to nations, is like your own life experience is to each and every one of you and me. And it informs the choices we make. And if you evaluate your, your own experience erroneously, and get the wrong end of the stick. And if you don't face why you were fired, but just say, no, 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 it was their fault, they were silly, or why something didn't come off, it was somebody else's fault, or simply do not learn the lessons of life, then you are probably going to make the wrong choices. And that is true of nations too. And that is why history matters enormously. Good history, that is. Thank you very much. Mr. Zamoyski, thank you very much for inspiring a little bit provocative presentation as well. I'm sure many questions arose in your uh, head, so now I open floor for discussion. Thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, can I say? Um, how do we? How do I, as a layman, distinguish which is good history and which is bad? Is someone going to sit there with an imprimatur? Well, that, that's very difficult. I mean, you. It, it's really. Um, I'm afraid one has to read a lot of history, good and bad. But you can usually um, begin to tell bad history. Um, largely from the way it's written. Um, but also, you know, there is, luckily, there are, uh, there are critics, there, there are reviews, and uh, they, are, they tend to be, um, well, they, they are at least indicators. They, they may not always be honest. Um, I think at the moment, um, the, on the whole, the history that is being written is good, apart from various fringe areas. Um, I would avoid, um, I would avoid a almost anything that's written on the um, uh, death of General Sikorsky um, and um, areas such as that. <laughs> you're, not in, you're not likely to encounter good history there. <coughs> Adam, may I ask you? after this very interesting explanation that his <coughs> history matter studiorum est no longer applies. Uh, hi history matter studiorum est no longer applies. T history applies? No, history no. matter studiorum est in Latin. To in other words, that we cannot base our knowledge on the history of historical on the facts of history. We can't base our knowledge on the facts of history. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, well, you are giving us an enormous amount of controversial situations. Yes. In, in, of, his, of history. It, it, we are taught at schools always that we learn our life based on history, historical facts. But this that does not apply anymore. Oh, no. I see what you mean. Um, no, th the fact is that uh, certain facts... There's a gentleman over there. That one. Um, the, the facts... Well, it depends what facts. But, you know, okay. Take... Um, well, take the, the, the relief of Vienna with Jan Sobieski. Uh, 
Um, the fact is there. Yes, he led an army and relieved Vienna. And nobody should immediately cross that out and say, nonsense, it was you know, a European coalition which relieved Vienna. Uh, but it is important to actually remind people and actually put the facts in, which in all Polish histories that I read until really in the last 30 years, the, um, the presence of large contingents of uh, German troops was very much sidelined, if mentioned at all. Um, the same thing about Waterloo. Um, when I went to school in this country, there was no question. You know, Waterloo was Wellington leading a British army which, which um, uh, defeated Napoleon. That was that. Um, and so you, you don't, as it were, you know, take the fact out. The fact is there, but the fact has been only partially told. And the point is you have to tell the whole story. Um, and, uh, you know, and, th and that's, that's really the, the, the point. Every fact is important, but, um, but it has to be looked at in, t in total and from both sides. There's a gentleman there who wished to say something. Well, historians read the documents and then write a history on the basis of documents. But th th sometimes they forget that, or they seem to think that if there is no document, no history. The thing don't exist if you have no written evidence. So there are to say that the, the Polish state, the first mention is 963. And, but this does not mean that the Polish history started at that day. If, because Polish state is, was at the time of about 200 years old. And in 19th century they thought that Jemowit uh, and Leszek and Jemomis and so on, they were just fiction. You know? It's it now accepted that they really existed. We don't know what they did, how they did, but they did exist. Because otherwise, the Polish state, as represented by Mieszko I, would be never be able to take political and religious decisions to accept Christianity. Yes. Now, the other thing, to say that we always fought with the Germans. Well, our relations with the German king or emperor, or emperors and that, uh, when the one of the them f at got the Dukes of Western Pomerania to as a fifth. Since that time, then German kings or German emperors never fought against Poland. All fought, we fought against. It was that either Teutonic Knights, which are not, not part of the German Empire, or uh, Brandenburg, which was part, but they did it on their own. So the, 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 other, the other thing is that written evidence does not necessarily have to be believed. For example, historians calculated that the Jews went to the Red Sea about times of the Ramses II. There's no mention of that in the Egyptian evidence. Yes. But they found that in Syrian documents, they said that they fought against the Ramses II, they won some battles, and they mentioned that these Jews actually went to the Red Sea. Now, the explanation is that probably if the, this was catastrophic. The, all, all the Egyptian elite was thrown in the middle of snow. They, they couldn't write about it. Yes. I, I, you, I mean, it's a very valid point that, that I mean, it's true that, um, well, first of all, documents were sometimes forged. And so you can't just treat every document as, as, as being um, true. And there is a valuation. And certainly all historians now accept that. Um, oral history, which was dismissed um, as being unscientific, is now in fact accepted as being um, very helpful and, um, and, and, and probably true because people treated memory uh, in a different way and had different memories because they um, handed things down by memory, they didn't write things down. So that's a, a perfectly, it's a perfectly valid point that. Um, and, and I agree that, that historians should, um, and, and historians do nowadays, take into account much more what the individual person, much more oral uh, attention is being paid to 
to oral history at every level, even uh, about recent history, even about the period of the Second World War. Uh, as you know, every new book produces more and more um, oral history as, as vignettes, as evidence, as, um, as accompanying evidence to, to the facts. Um, and so that, that's a very valid point. And as you say, in, in, um, it turns out that many of the stories in the Bible uh, do have some element of, um, of fact behind them. Um, but again, how they're presented is, is actually quite, quite an important thing. There was somebody right at the so, back. So uh, we've got time for two more questions, and I had two gentlemen. Uh, yes, well, right. Thank you very much. You compared individuals to nations, or rather the other way around, nation being collection of individuals. Um, in the extremely rich, in fact, uh, lecture, you also have cast a lot of doubt, in a sense, on the very, some, on the very uh, assertion that there is such a thing as uh, a rational interpretation of history, the only true version of history. You look back at least a thousand years or so, everything is packed with inaccuracies, relativities, truths, untruths, and outright lies. You refer to the past 30 years or so in British historiography, how rational, intelligent, sensible uh, revisionism it is. Even in Poland, 689, the constructive, intelligent revisionism, myth building is very important, as you know, in nation forming proposition. In fact, one could argue that it is as rational as building up fiction, as long as it serves a good purpose. Would you agree that in due course, all this constructive revisionism of modern historians is going to be subjected to equally critical views as yours are now? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, the, the, I mean, the whole point about um, uh, writing history is that you, you continually have to question um, not only the facts, but also your judgment of them. And, you know, I, I, a very good example is I wrote, I published a book in 1987 called The Polish Way, which was a general sort of history of, of Poland for, 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 um, for foreigners, really, for people who didn't know anything <coughs> about it. Um, and in um, about 2008 or something, um, my publisher suggested that we should reprint this because Poland had joined the EU and more and more people were coming and going. So I thought, what a wonderful idea. Um, and so I, I said, I'd better just look through and do some slight revision and maybe bring in some corrections. Uh, I read through it and I, I said, I, I can't publish this now. This was written in another century in another place. Yeah. I, was, I was writing the history of an enslaved nation which barely existed, which didn't have a voice. I was in a way, um, you know, it was, and now suddenly there was a completely different situation. It's, you know, I mean, you could almost say that the other one was written as though I was like a homily at the graveside of a dead friend. And suddenly, it turned out the guy got up and walked and was actually starting a new business. And, and uh, you know, and, and <laughs> you had to suddenly the whole, I mean, the, the aspect of so many things um, changed. You could not look at it in the same way. And, for instance, you know, a very good example is the Liberum Veto. We were all brought up to think it was the most appalling, dreadful, mad, perverse, um, ridiculous thing and so on um, because everybody thought in categories of the nation state of strength of centralization of having big armies surviving the Darwinian struggle between states well that struggle has come to an end we're in something called the European Union um, yes we probably are going to carry on a Darwinian struggle against the Chinese and 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 and, and possibly um, others um, but it's not going to be conducted probably on along the same lines and on the same rules. And just looking at the European scene, 
the whole Polish idea of minimal government, um, locally elected judicial services, locally elected militias, and, um, and a, a strong power of veto would appeal to most people in Europe at the moment very, very strongly. They'd think, quelle bonne idée, certainly in France at the moment, um, if they could um, have a liberal veto there, and certainly the Germans as well. So you, you suddenly see, you know, it wasn't so dumb necessarily. It, it, it always depends where you're standing. Um, I mean, the facts are the facts, Things, everything looks very different from different angles. Otherwise, historian can say two different things, and both are truths, depending on the time. Yeah, there is, there is no such thing as total objectivity in history. There cannot be. Um, and the historian's uh, duty is to try and be as truthful and as honest with himself. You know, you, you, you think, can I really say this? Um, and that's really the thing, is, is as long as historians try to be honest and not to, to make a case for one side or another, try and sell one idea or sell another idea, that's not his business. Um, you know, his business at the worst is to say, well, I don't know, but these, this, these are the facts as I see them. I find it all baffling, but there you go. There was one more question at the back, I think. That uh, so, good evening. Thank you for your lecture, which is quite informative. I must admit that your uh, name... Uh, has come quite uh, lately to my, uh, well, to me. I mean, I'm, I mean, in last November, a Jewish friend of mine has uh, presented me with uh, presented me with a copy of a Standpoint magazine, uh, where there was a review of his uh, of a book of uh, Halik Kohansky, uh, the fate of a forgotten ally, and in this book you did say, uh, I quote, the Nazis and Soviets deliberately set their victims against each other. And after the war, Poles, Jews, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and even the evicted Germans stake trivial claims of uh, victimhood, which usually involves belittling the sufferings of the others and accusing them of collaboration, further clouding the picture. I don't know if you've heard about the latest BBC's purchase. Uh, it was they acquired a TV series uh, from Germany about, uh, well, it's, for me, it's utter shambles, it's all lies. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, what is your view about the subject? And uh, my second uh, question, I, I do apologize, uh, in a different uh, article, you did say one lesson to be learned from the past couple of centuries is surely that European Christian humanist civilization with its fruits of demo democracy, civil liberty and all the rest is in, its, uh, is in itself a very powerful weapon Poland, it cannot be then denied that uh, what preserved the Poles in the face of immeasurably superior odds and unspeakably ghastly ordeals were those very values. Uh, you suggested at the very end of your lecture that uh, we could, for example, create a union between Poland, Germany, Russia. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, in Germany, do you have any European Christian uh, humanist civilization? I don't think so. Do we have in Russia, do, can we enjoy fruits of democracy in Russia? I doubt it. Don't forget, Thank you. Don't forget that um, the Greeks, when they were being taken over by the Romans, said, don't worry, they will conquer us, but we will civilize them. <laughs> and the same paradigm um, was many Poles thought at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th that they could do with Russia what they had done with Lithuania 200 years, 300 years before. Um, so you never know. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen this, this serial you were talking about, um, but um, so I don't know. Um, the fact is... Uh, there is an, a curious phenomenon which is again a human phenomenon. Human beings like to shunt their own guilt onto other people. Uh, human beings hate nobody so much as the people they have harmed or hurt. Um, 
After the war, most nations of Europe, indeed of the whole Western world, including America, felt extremely uncomfortable, and this discomfort was formed part of the Western consciousness throughout the whole second half of the 20th century. A great discomfort about the the culture of the first half of the century and its appalling apogee in the Second World War. Nobody, not the Brits, not the French, not the Americans, felt particularly good about how they had responded to the Jewish problem. There was rampant anti-Semitism before the war everywhere and during the war. The Americans refused to let Jews in, so did the Brits. The French were happy to denounce them and have them all sent off to um, Auschwitz. Um, Every country before the war had authoritarian, fascism regimes or parties or movements or instincts. And after the war, it became extremely convenient to shunt it all onto somebody else. And at first, it was all shunted on, obviously, onto Germany. But suddenly, Germany became a very, very important part of Europe and the European project. So you couldn't sit there accusing or putting all the ills of the 20th century and hanging them on Germany. So other culprits had to be found. And it just so happens that Poland (laughs) was the ideal culprit for this. Um, And this is something that's almost... You can't really fight against this kind of thing either with argument or with evidence or with facts. You can argue till you're blue in the face how many Jewish generals there were in the Polish army, that the the inspector general of police before the war was a Jew, that, you know, things which were unthinkable in this country or America or France. They will still happily say, oh, but you were sort of murdering anti-Semites. And it it is extraordinary. Um, it, it's, it's become part of the, 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 well, the denial and the bad history of various other societies. Um, and it's very painful for, uh, for, for, for Poles, but um, it, it will actually pass, as ba- bad history does pass, but it'll take a long time, I'm afraid. On which happy note, I think I'd better bow out. Thank you all very much. <laughs>